Welcome to the Migraine Miracle Moment. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Turknett. I'm a neurologist, migraine specialist, migraine sufferer, and author of the book, The Migraine Miracle. In this podcast, you'll learn all about how to find your path to migraine freedom without pills. Let's get started. Hey folks, so in this episode, I'm going to be talking about something that comes up quite a lot in the migraine community, and that is the topic of the connection between changes in the weather, or specifically barometric pressure, and migraines. So in the migraine community at large, there's definitely a prevailing perception that changes in the weather, particularly a strong weather system, is a migraine trigger, and for some people they would say a very strong trigger. And oftentimes that Uh, is attributed to the changes specifically in barometric pressure uh, because strong weather systems generally occur when there are large pressure changes, as any weather channel junkie will tell you. And we've certainly received a number of questions on this topic over the years, including a lot of people who ask what they should do specifically for migraines that are brought about by changes in the weather. So that's the topic for the day, and in this episode, what I'm going to do is break things down and give you what I think are the three most important things to understand and take away when it comes to this particular topic. So before I get into the meat of that topic, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. As of the time of this recording, we've recently kicked off our last, our latest Keto Blast, which is our 30-day Keto Challenge for migraineurs. Uh, there's still time to hop on board and be part of it if you want to. Uh, we got a uh, great influx of new folks who were uh, with us for the first time in Migrant Neverland and taking part of this challenge. And uh, as a reminder, the Keto Blast and all of our 30-day challenges are available as one of the many benefits of being a member of Migrant Neverland. So you have access to all of our 30-day challenges and you can participate in as many as you would like. In fact, I did a poll at the start of this sir, at this of this keto challenge, and about half of the people who were there uh, have already done it before and are doing it again for the second, third, or more time. So it's something you, that um, you can do as many times as you like, and you know it comes with the extra support of a community around you to do it with, uh, which always um, helps with the accountability and just is just more fun to do things as part of a group. So there's uh, that resources for for you, and if you want to see the full schedule of challenges for the remainder of the year, you can have head over to mymigraimiracle.com forward slash schedule. We just wrapped up our first ever sleep challenge, which I really enjoyed, and I'm sure we're going to repeat that one again, uh, probably uh, in 2020. And if you want to learn more about becoming a member and all the many things that are included with membership, just head over to mymigraimiracle.com and click on the resources tab at the top menu, and you'll see the nine ways that we can help, including Migrant Neverland membership. And I know I say this a lot, but I'm consistently amazed by the incredible people in our Migrant Neverland community. We recently recorded several more interviews to share with you on this podcast with our members, and I'm just consistently blown away at what an amazing group of people we have, and I can't wait to share those episodes with you. And so if you're one of our members and you're listening right now, thank you so much for being so awesome. Okay, so back to the topic of the day, which is the connection between migraines and changes in the weather, or specifically also changes in barometric pressure. And I think the first place to start, if we're going to be doing a deep dive into this, is to ask, is this actually true? So there are a number of things that are commonly bandied about in the migraine world uh, that are taken as established truths, uh, many of which have either not been shown to be true or have been demonstrated to be false. So the first thing we want to do in the name of advancing human knowledge and truth and not barking down wrong trees and blind alleys is to first see what the research has to say on this topic. I think many people are going to be surprised to learn that the research here isn't at all clear. Given the prevailing perception that changes in the weather and changes in pressure are a major trigger, I think many would think that the research on this topic would be a a slam dunk, but that's certainly not the case. So it's a question that's been studied by various researchers around the world over the past you know, couple decades or so. One of the challenges here is designing a study that can actually get you closer to an answer to this question. And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about why this can be particularly challenging for an issue like this. But I'm going to review a few of the published studies on this topic. And I won't go into too much detail about the specifics of the methodology or the statistical analyses as that's beyond the scope of this discussion. However, I think even 
after this bird's eye view of the published data, some very useful themes will emerge and conclusions that we can make. And if you want to take a look at these studies for yourself, I uh, will provide the links on the show notes page on the on the website, which you can go to by uh, going to mymigrainmiracle.com forward slash moment. And there you'll have a menu of all of the prior podcast episodes, including this one. So uh, let's take one study, which was published in 2011 in the journal Neurology. And in this one, they retrospectively analyzed the headache diary of 20 migraineurs and correlated at four-hour intervals uh, their diary to atmospheric pressure, temperature, and uh, relative air humidity. And they did this for a period of 12 consecutive months, and this actually took place in Berlin, Germany. Now, one interesting note here, just as an aside, was that uh, they've all, they found that migraines were most likely to occur at 4 a.m., and that's probably a pretty consistently recognized uh, finding. And we talk a lot about how critical it is to prevent these middle-of-the-night attacks. Uh, this is a subject we've covered a lot in the um, in Migraine Everland in the Beast Slayer Academy as well as in clinic chats, and it may be worthy of an episode uh, topic in the future, but th- suffice to say there's a lot that we can do to prevent uh, those middle-of-the-night attacks, which really moves the needle forward uh, since those are uh, the time when they're most likely to occur and the worst attacks ten- tend to occur. So anyways, back to the topic at hand. So what they found in this study was that there was an association between temperature and higher humidity in six people. And so their conclusions uh, from this study was that there was a subgroup of migraine patients who were weather sensitive. Now, this was a retrospective study with small numbers, only 20 people, and making correlations amongst multiple variables, um, all of these things which introduce a significant amount of noise into the data. So this kind of study should be taken with a big grain of salt, but at least there's a suggestion of a connection in uh, some and a subset of the patients in this study. Another study was published in the International Journal of Biometeorology. Who knew that biometeorology was a thing? (laughs) So in that study, they looked uh, at the link between air mass types, and I'll explain what that is in a second, and ER visits for migraines over a seven-year period, and this was in North Carolina. And what they found was that there were more uh, ER visits on tropical air mass days and fewer ER, ER visits, and these are ER visits for migraines, on polar air mass days. So warm tropical air, more migraines, cooler polar air, fewer. And the effect here was not big, and also this is just correlational data, remember, and it's retrospective, meaning looking backwards. So you can't conclude at all that these things are causally linked, but again, there's a correlation. Now, interestingly, in this same study, they found no correlations between ER visits for migraine and the magnitude of change in barometric pressure. So that means that even if there was a direct relationship between these meteorological changes, and specifically these changes in air mass and migraine, which again, we can't conclude a direct relationship, but we, if that's true, we can say that even if that is a direct connection, it's not being mediated by changes in barometric pressure. So that's that study. In a study in 2004 in the journal Headache, they looked at the diaries of 77 migraineurs for a period of 2 to 24 months. And at the onset of the study, each subject uh, had to fill out a questionnaire on their beliefs about the influence of weather on their migraines. And then, using the, the diaries, they looked at the association between three factors. One was temperature and humidity, another was changing weather pattern, and the third was barometric pressure. And what they found was that there were correlations with these weather variables in about half of the subjects. And the most significant correlation was, again, between temperature and humidity. Now, there were also some significant methodological limitations with this study. Um, Again, you can only uh, say there are correlation between these variables. These do not uh, demonstrate causation. But thus far, in the studies that do show an association between the weather and migraines, most of that association is being found between temperature and humidity and not barometric pressure changes. Also, in this study, they found that there were a number of patients who, in that initial questionnaire, believed that the weather and specifically barometric pressure changes were a major trigger, but after doing the analysis, found no association in those patients. Now, in general, prospective studies where you track subjects over the course of a study yield superior information uh, or more reliable information than retrospective studies where you look at subject data after the fact, um, all other things being equal. 
So in 2011, uh, probably the largest prospective study on this topic that I've seen, this one was published in the journal Cephalgia, and it involved 238 migraineurs who were living within 25 kilometers of the Vienna Meteorological Station. So they were able to co collect really good uh, weather data uh, for these folks that we, they, we, they knew was applicable because folks live so close to where the data was being collected. And they maintained a diary for 90 days, and they al analyzed 11 uh, meteorological parameters and 17 different weather situations. And ultimately, they found no statistically significant association between migraines and any of the weather parameters, leading the authors of that study to conclude that, quote, the influence of weather factors on migraine and headaches is small and questionable, end quote. So those are four studies that I think give you a pretty representative picture of at least what the published data on this topic says right now. And because of that, there are plenty of migraine researchers who would say that really there's no convincing link between weather changes and barometric pressure, or if there is, it's questionable or mild. So now that we've reviewed some of the published research trying to answer this question, what conclusions can we draw from it? So first, I think we can draw that heat and humidity is the most significant weather factor. And that actually doesn't come as any surprise. That's a link that's been pretty well established. But don't make the mistake of thinking that means you should avoid the heat altogether. Uh, on the contrary, avoiding heat altogether would be one of the worst reactions to that data. Now, why is that? Well, our ability to regulate body temperature and keep ourselves cool when it's hot outside requires all sorts of physiological processes, which are dependent on specific proteins, and the genes for those proteins are turned on when you are exposing yourself to heat. So you are adapted to different climates, uh, depending on how long you've been exposed to that climate. So if we take someone who's going outdoors every day as they transition from winter to summer, gradually those genes are being turned on and the body is continually adapting to the heat. And now imagine someone else who's not going outside at all during the transition from winter to summer or avoids it as much as possible. And then one day during the summer, they go outside and are out in the heat for several hours for whatever reason. The first individual is going to be well adapted and the body's mechanisms for regulating body temperature and protecting itself from the heat will be fully online. Whereas the second person is going to have none of that and the heat is going to be a huge homeostatic stressor. So guess which one of these people is going to be far more likely to be visited by the beast. So in this instance, avoiding the heat altogether makes you far more prone to heat-induced migraines. And this same principle applies to so many things. So by avoiding something altogether, we continue to lower our resilience to that thing, thereby creating self-fulfilling prophecies. Because guess what happens when our heat avoider goes out in the heat and is visited by the beast in the summer? That only further reinforces the notion that they're heat sensitive. So they end up avoiding it even more and becoming even less resilient uh, and more sensitive and so on. And these kind of vicious cycles happen all the time. So this, this topic of the connections between heat and migraine probably deserve its, deserves its own episode. So I'll get back to our primary to topic of the day. But just to summarize, the first thing that we can conclude from the data on the connection between weather and migraine migraines is that heat and humidity are the most significant factors and there's much that we can do to make ourselves more resilient in the face of that. The next thing we can say is that if, if changes in barometric pressure or, or weather fronts are a trigger, they're likely a weak one. So if that wasn't the case, then it wouldn't be so challenging to find a signal for this cor correlation in the data. So if it were a strong trigger, then it would jump right out of the data, which it's not doing. It wouldn't be, you wouldn't be having to comb through it so hard and figure out all these different ways to assess it to even find if there is any type of connection. And then the data also says that if it is a trigger, it's likely only relevant for a subset of folks. And that furthermore, that uh, migraineurs weren't particularly good at identifying whether or not they were part of that subset. So I think that without a doubt, the prevailing belief here uh, in the broader migrant community is much greater than the reality. As the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman famously said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. And that's certainly true uh, in the realm of migraines. But for the sake of argument, let's say that there is a subset of migraineurs who have at least some degree of sensitivity to uh, weather fronts. And if you're in that category, or at least think you are, what should you do about those? 
And the first and key point that I want to make here is that there's nothing fundamentally different about a migraine that's brought on by this factor than, than one that's brought on by anything else. So once that migraine switch is flipped, migraines are migraines. And we see this confusion a lot uh, in the migraine world. And I've talked about it on uh, prior episodes with respect to hormonal versus vestibular migraines and so on. So the good news is that what we do in response doesn't really change depending on what the triggering or associated factors were. The bedrock foundation of how to protect ourselves is always the same, and that's the three pillars of protection that you've heard me talk about before. And additionally, once the beast has come to visit, how you'd handle it is also the same. We've talked about our drug-free strategies here in the past, including my favorite one, which I did two episodes on, which is the Starve and Sink. And in fact, you've heard this from many people in our community, including uh, several people who've been on the podcast, is that one of the great joys of implementing the plan is that they no longer have these issues with weather systems. So they used to be very afraid when strong storms would come through, and now they aren't. So the ultimate strategy is to prevent them in the first place, to build up the three pillars of protection to the point where even if some weather system comes through, it still can't bring you near the threshold for triggering the beast. And as far as what to do when a system comes through, um, one that we believe based on experience could raise our vulnerability, or if we uh, start feeling a little bit headachy, um, I would generally handle this exactly the same way I'd handle any other scenario where something beyond my control has raised my vulnerability, like traveling across time zones or eating a, quote, cheat meal. So that includes things like fasting uh, or reducing my carbs to nearly zero. Um, increasing the interval from my last meal to bedtime, and lots of uh, low-intensity physical activity. And the best thing there is lots of walking. So the point here being that if indeed changes in air pressure ha are a factor in sort of raising our vulnerability to an attack, there's not really anything we can do about that factor specifically. But we can. Uh, what we can do is focus on the things that we know help us and just go all in on those things. The second thing here is that, again, if this is a factor, it's not likely as significant as we might think. So changes in the weather or barometric pressure have likely been the falsely accused scapegoat uh, far more often than it's been the actual culprit. And even when it does contribute, it's only going to be one of many, many factors. So remember the balloons and weight analogy. And it's only one of many balloons that has contributed to bringing us over the migraine threshold. And I think its actual contribution towards bringing us closer is probably going to be less than many folks believe. I think the perception is amongst many is that if there's some kind of weather system rolling in, then a migraine is inevitable. But were that the case, we would not have such a hard time demonstrating it to be true in the research. The signal should be plenty large enough to see it through the noise. For example, when we look at the association between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer, we find a huge signal, so it's clear as day, so we know that smoking is significantly associated with lung cancer risk. And this is not true of the research on barometric pressure and migraines. So even though I think it is likely an issue for some folks, the signal is still very weak, which means it's not nearly as big a factor as I think most folks believe. And then lastly, Given the research I've described, which shows that if indeed weather systems are a trigger, their contribution isn't likely as significant as we think, I think it's really important to not let our expectations work against us. So as I said earlier, studies have shown that many who report barometric pressures, ch pressure ch so as I said earlier, studies have shown that some folks who report barometric ch pressure changes as being a tra major trigger show no association at all when this is actually studied prospectively. So that begs the question of what's actually leading those folks to believe that this is true, that there is, there is an association. And one big reason why, and one big reason why this is a really tough issue to study and answer this question, is confirmation bias. So imagine you've heard that there's a connection between weather systems or changes in barometric pressure and migraines. So on the days when there's a weather system and you get a migraine, you're going to notice that association and you're going to be likely to blame the migraine on that uh, weather phenomenon. And that's precisely because we've been primed to think that the weather system causes migraines. So even if you're no more likely than chance to be visited by the beast on a day when there's a weather front rolling in, confirmation bias alone is going to make you believe that association exists. And so it's only when you look prospectively, as these studies have tried to do, and track it with weather data, 
to see whether you're actually more likely to experience a migraine when there's a weather system that you can answer this particular question. So that's one way in which our expectations can mislead us and, and lead us to believe there's a connection where none exists. And then there's another even more insidious and sinister way in which our expectations can undermine us. So it's quite possible that given the re relatively weak signal linking migraines and weather systems, that the expectation alone of migraines uh, occurring more likely with weather systems has actually led to more migraines than the systems themselves. So we know the impact of anxiety on migraine, and we've talked about the nocebo effect in the past, which is the expect expectation that something is going to have a negative impact on you makes that uh, negative impact more likely. And that's purely a result of your thoughts or expectations and not the thing itself. So you could make a very good argument that the single best strategy for dealing with weather system related migraines is to at least believe that there's no connection between them whatsoever. Since believing that there is a connection can only do more harm than good. You can't control the weather, but you can control your expectations. So I think it's definitely safe to say that not only has this issue received far more attention than it deserves, but it would be really great for everyone if it received less attention than it deserved because the attention itself may be fueling the problem. All right, so that's all I've got for this episode. Remember, you can find the show notes and episode transcripts for all of these uh, episodes of The Miracle Moment uh, by going to mymigrainmiracle.com forward slash moment. And the show notes for this episode will include links to all the studies that I mentioned, including a few more on the topic of uh, weather and migraines. And if you enjoyed this podcast and you want to help uh, other people to discover it, it'd be awesome if you left a rating and review in iTunes. It really helps and it really means a lot. All right, so hopefully you found this to be a thought-provoking and actionable episode. Now it's time to take that knowledge, go out and slay the beast. Mm -hmm.